A Motion Picture Hero by Epps Winthrop Sargent Lieutenant Frederick Strassman of His Imperial Majesty's forces stood before the long pier mirror and regarded with complacency the trim image in the silvered substance of the fine French plate. The lieutenant scarcely could be blamed for his self-admiration, for the polished surface showed him a tall, well-set-up young fellow whose dark, wavy hair fell over a high, white brow arcing above a pair of brown eyes that seemed fairly to speak a language of their own. The finely chiseled nose and the mouth, mobile and as finely cut as though done by an artist hand, gave added distinction to a face that might have been born of the rich imagination of some old Greek sculptor of the Golden Age. Decidedly, the lieutenant was well worth looking at, and this thought was uppermost in his mind as he pulled almost invisible wrinkles out of his tunic and gave a final touch to the medals that attested valor hey billy stop that prinking and come out think we've got all day to wait get a move on coming called the lieutenant otherwise billy vaughn as he caught up his busby and adjusted it with a care that suggested that presently he would stick hat pins in it to keep it in place with a final pat he hurried out of the tiny dressing-room on the other side of the deal door was the unreal land of photoplay a great space with grilled roof and glass sides with an unbroken expanse like a drill floor but now dotted with screens of scenery and little groups of players at the far end made gay with the uniforms of the officers stood the black and white and gray reproduction of an apartment that might have suggested the casemate of some fortress were it not for the stage braces that held up the painted flats close at hand a score of indians lounged in a log cabin and talked baseball with some early pilgrim fathers whom presently they were to slaughter while in between rose a stately ballroom with a throng of dancers harry seaton had slipped from the log cabin to the ballroom to show to the admiring girls the necklace of cow's teeth that was the present joy of his pale face heart since it was the newest addition to his wardrobe his skin gleamed redly with the accepted tint of the indian but the sickening odor of cheap scent betrayed the fact that his complexion came in sticks and boxes labeled grease paint with never a word of greetings given or received vaughn hurried to join his brother officers where bob tunk their real commanding officer stood beside the camera operator tapping his leg with his megaphone sorry bob apologized vaughn but a fellow has to get his togs on straight you know and a fellow has to turn a couple of scenes a day if he wants to hold his job retorted the director it's all right though joe comes down with his face looking like a country map roads in red trolley lines in blue and township lines in black i can't seem to make the blame fool realize that he ain't on the stage and that he wants to go at light on the makeup now if you was playing the general billy you'd eat it up for fair my contract calls for juvenile leads only reminded vaughn in the raspy little voice that the studio people had grown used to and no longer laughed at i know you've a contract worse luck grumbled tunk thank your stars you got into the game before most of us when actors could dictate but all the same billy if you'd can that matinee hero stuff and take the parts you're fitted for you'd get a raise in salary that would startle you you'd make a name to boot a name repeated vaughn why bob there's two inquiries about me for every time anyone else has mentioned once and my photographs sell better than Johnnelly's. complacently he stepped into the scene and tunk said things under his breath as he welcomed the belated joseph with a frown and drew the scenario from his pocket now that mr fister looks a little less like the tattooed man he said briskly let's see if we can't do a couple of scenes here's the idea Billy and Gray have had a scrap at a ball. Billy has smashed Gray, and now he's being court-martialed for striking his superior officer. We haven't done the ball yet, but you've been hit, Gray, and you want to show that you're sore on Billy. Joe is president of the court, and Frank is the judge advocate. You sit at the head of the table, Joe. Frank, you come over here. Ben and Tom sit on Joe's right, and Ned, Harry, and Butch on the left. All you have to do is to listen and look wise. You two fellows are the guards. 
you come in with mr vaughn and when you get him into the scene you step back and leave him by himself and if you drop your guns again like you did in the outside scene yesterday somebody will have to telephone for the coroner get off the scene billy and take those two dummies with you all you fellows sit down but frank gets up when billy comes in gray didn't i tell you to sit over there my fault all right let's run through it come on billy fall back you dunderheads get up frank and show billy where to stand tell him about it gray you call him a name and billy biffs you and everybody jumps in and tries to separate you two everybody means those two pieces of wood by the door i'm going to chop a little kindling if you sticks don't get busy start again and see how badly you can do it half a dozen times the scene was rehearsed until even the two extra men played with some spirit then tunk called for lights and the cameraman straightened up the automatic arcs clinked and the vapor lamps clicked as the current began to flow and with the traditional they're off the camera began to whir as the sensitized film was jerked past the opening that night a man made his way along picture row where half a score of picture theaters blazed their invitations to the fans he paused in front of one or two scanning the posters but presently his search was rewarded by the sight of the star in crescent trademark of the turco film company he bought a ticket and slipped inside taking his seat in the thick of the crowd now that his hat was off his head gleamed pink and polished above the scanty fringe of hair and powerful eyeglasses alone enabled him to see the faces on the screen his own face was dull and tired seamed with the tiny lines of care and he sat bent and huddled in his seat like some tired bookkeeper seeking relaxation in the movies the picture on the screen did not interest him and he regarded with listless air the fine work of johnnelly the star of the v-scope but the next title bore the legend he sought and he straightened up and looked about him there was a ripple of applause as vaughn in a well-fitting riding suit came upon the screen stage but not even the man sitting next to him connected the tired spectator with the resplendent star whose name was known wherever picture machines were turned avidly vaughn drank in the appreciative comment of the crowd about him then he slipped out to find another house where he might again see himself as others saw him it was for this he lived these nights in the photoplay theatres where he could sit in the darkened house and listen to the applause and the comment it was better even than in the old days when he had been the idol of the matinee girls when he had been young and good-looking without the aid of wigs and pads of paint and powder then the country had rung with his name now old and rheumatic he had found a new glory in the silent drama and he could feel that thousands watched his work each night and declared him great even as those about him were doing he was withered and worn and the voice that once had boomed sonorously the lines of romeo or claude melnot had broken to an absurd squeak that carried scarcely ten feet but he was the beauty hero still and nightly the thought stirred him it was the failure of his voice that had driven him from the boards he had fallen from the greatness of stardom to the trying routine of the ten twent third stock company and his voice already sorely tried had given way under the strain of two performances and daily rehearsal he might have stayed in better company but he would not admit that he could no longer play leads with the youngest of them not until a friend had suggested the picture companies where voices were not needed did he exert himself to gain a position with them in those days when to play in the pictures was regarded almost as a disgrace vaughn found it easy to make terms on a long time contract with bilton manager of the turco company he would play romantic leads or nothing and so the contract ran now he held them rigidly to the contract though tunk stormed and the others grumbled bilton smilingly upheld vaughn who had made the early reputation of the turco and the director was powerless though he realized that in character work vaughn would find an even greater fame and he fairly ached to make the big productions for which he drew up scenarios and sought to tempt the star vaughn would have none of them he gloried in the succession of romantic parts even more numerous than in the stock days but unaccompanied by the wearing study 
his whole salary save for the mere pittance spent for board and the picture shows went to add to his already extensive modern wardrobe and he was at once the despair and the joke of the wardrobe mistress because of his exactions about the dressing of costume plays it hurt him sometimes that the others held him a man apart he was human beneath his vanity and unconsciously or otherwise he craved the fellowship of his associates but they had small use for a man who could talk only of his past glories and of his wonderful success in the films tunk was friendly because he understood and because he hoped to win vaughn over but even tunk grew disgusted at times and kept away and the applause of the audiences was but a poor substitute for the clasp of a friendly hand he was earlier than usual the next morning for they were to take the scenes at the ball where the offence for which he had been tried the day before had been committed trial before transgression was common enough in the studio where the scenes are made as is most convenient and vaughn gave it no thought as he slipped into the gorgeous full-dress uniform a glitter with gold but to-day even glitter and gold lace did not possess their usual appeal through the half-open door of the dressing-room he could see harry seaton trying to steal a kiss from betty nelson the pretty leading woman and he knew it would not be long before he would be asked to contribute a dollar toward a wedding present the others were coming in now with morning greetings to hurry to their dressing-rooms extra men and women for the ballroom scene were straggling past with costumes over their arms and the stage crew busied themselves with the settings but no one looked in at the door with a cheery call and vaughn was glad when the summons came to start harry seaton was to be one of the guests at the ball and the cow teeth necklace and the beaded moccasins were exchanged for evening dress he and betty made a handsome pair as they stood chatting while tunk rounded up some of the dilatory guests and it was with evident reluctance that betty moved over to vaughn when the rehearsal commenced she was a very human little body and she disliked the priggish posing lover who always planned the love scenes so that his own face showed to the camera betty wanted to be in the picture and she resented vaughn's calm fashion of taking the center of the stage as she came toward him vaughn offered his arm with perfunctory courtesy but betty drew back wait until i have to she snapped and to her surprise vaughn smiled it was a weary tired smile but none the less it was the nearest he had come to a laugh since she had been in the company perhaps he might be human after all it was a short hard scene the end of a dance with the stage crowded with guests who moved off as the picture opened to leave the stage clear for the principals vaughn came on with betty leaving her while he went on for an ice and gray followed in to make passionate love until vaughn's return stopped his advances and brought on a row that culminated in a blow just as the crowd surged back attracted by betty's cries of alarm the extra people took a deal of rehearsing but at last they caught the idea and tunk called for the lights to help out the gray day dimness of the studio the extras trooped off to the accompaniment of frenzied shouts from tunk and vaughn and betty entered to commence their brief scene back of the canvas the regular players were marshalling the extras to have them ready for the return to the stage and the shouts and confusion almost drowned the tinkling crash as the globe of one of the arc lights cracked and came tumbling through the tracing cloth diffusing screen setting fire to the wax fabric broken globes are too common in dark studios to arouse comment tunk ran to an extinguisher as did his camera operator the extra screamed and the actor sought to stay in the incipient panic with the assurance that it would be out in a moment only vaughn was there by betty as a fragment of the globe heated almost to incandescence set fire to the filmy chiffon of her dress newly cleaned with gasoline for the scene he made no outcry as the flame flashed up but he sprang toward her and bore her to the floor beating the flame from her face with the wig he had snatched from his head while his other hand sought to tear up the floor cloth to wrap about her the flame curled about his head and face and he fought desperately but he was not even conscious of his hurts his one thought was to save the girl and not until the stream from the extinguisher struck the blazing mass blanketing the flame with chemical gas did he realize that he was sorely hurt it was all over in an instant and the crowd was rushing into the scene as vaughn rose to his feet groping blindly for support his thin fringe of hair was crisp and black and his face seared and blistered 
while tears streamed from the smoke-filled eyes and washed furrows of white through the grime there was a sudden hush as fister who had been a hospital orderly once led vaughn to his room and made hasty application of first aid while they waited for the ambulance surgeon then they took vaughn to the hospital where for many a weary day and restless night he tossed upon his bed of pain they could not assure him that those scars would not remain and with an almost feminine sensitiveness he refused to see any of the studio people tunk came once to the darkened room but the visit unsettled vaughn and the doctors forbade another call but each day a message came and flowers too while vaughn counted the dragging minutes then came a day when bilton called in his car to take him back to work and presently vaughn stood in front of the familiar door trying to forget the gateman's pitying glance for a moment he faltered then he pulled himself together and stepped within for a time no one saw him three cameras were busy and only the shouts of the directors broke the quiet directly ahead betty and seaton were playing a love scene and it was the girl who first saw him she sprang straight out of the scene regardless of the shouts of the bewildered tongue that film cost three cents a foot and she had spoiled a hundred feet without reply she sped past him to throw her arms about the neck of the man who stood uncertainly in the doorway tunk followed her with his glance and with a yell that rang through the studio he threw his megaphone into the air and followed her it was a signal to the others and in a moment they were all clustered about vaughn indians and half-breeds court ladies and desperados salvation army lassies and leather-coated pioneers they flock about him grasping his hand slapping him on the back or loudly inquiring what might be the matter with billy vaughn and answering the question themselves they fought for a chance to come close to the hero and there was something so hearty so genuine in their welcome that vaughn's throat choked up and his voice became more squeaky than ever as he sought to reply to their greeting standing with betty smiling into his face and harry seaton apparently trying to fracture his shoulder blades with his open palm it was the first time since vaughn had ceased to be a human and had become a matinee hero that he really knew what it meant to have friends and he was not ashamed of the tears that wet his face then tunk took possession of him and led the way to the dressing-room which the women had decorated with flowers and flags on the pier glass the men had scrawled kindly greetings with bits of soap until the surface was white with friendly messages and scarcely a hint of the scarred face was reflected from the cherished possession it'll wash off easy explained harry seaton not understanding the look that came over vaughn's face it's just soap and a damp cloth damp cloth be hanged cried vaughn with a laugh that was a little wistful in spite of his heartiness i shan't need that vanity coaxer if i'm going to play character parts character parts be hanged too broke in tunk when things quiet down a bit billy you make up and we'll make a test trip to see if the scars can't be hidden i don't want to hide them said vaughn soberly as he laid his hands on tunk's shoulders they brought me friends bob and made a real man of me again if i ever try to pretty up you'll do me a favor if you beat my empty head in let harry play the lovers he'll need more money if he is going to marry betty and i'll do the character parts like i should it's worth more than scars bob to be one of you and i'm one of you at last thank god <laughs>